<clears throat> All right, title of the sermon this morning is The Temptation of Jesus Christ. The Temptation of Jesus Christ. So we're going to go through uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and um, I'll explain you know, a bit about those temptations and um, then some applications for us at the end. So the temptation of Jesus Christ. Now temptation in the Bible, that word does not only mean uh, what we think it to mean today, right? Like we think temptation to mean uh, only, you know, the temptation to fulfill a pleasure, right? And we think well, when we're tempted to do something, we're tempted to eat something or maybe it's drugs or uh, sex or other things like that. That's what we think of when it comes to temptation, uh, just overcoming some sort of sinful pleasure. But it can also refer to in the Bible as just being tested as well. So when you hear the word temptation in the Bible, it's not only when it comes to like these sinful pleasures, it's also just tempted to do what's right. If you think of the word tempted in the Bible, like Abraham was tempted to do what was right. Um, so that was more like a test uh, than, than the way we think of the word temptation. Now, one thing when we think about the temptation of Jesus Christ that I think it's good to reflect on is that our God is not an impersonal God. You know, some people believe in just like some, you know, karma force or just some spiritual force that's out there, but it's not a personal um, God that we, uh, that, that is worshipped. Whereas the God of the Bible is a personal God, right? Where God has a mind, he has emotions, he, ta he took on flesh here, where he even uh, experienced the things that we experience but yet without sin. But we serve not an impersonal God. We serve a personal God that knows us and, you know, and, and considers us. Uh, look what it says here in Psalm 8. David uh, uh, says here, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. And sometimes when we consider the heavens, just the vast nature of of the universe and the stars and everything that's out there. It's humongous. We realize how small earth is on this grand scale. But look what he says here in verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? You know, we realize the greatness of God and the vastness and, the, and how, how you know, great he is, right? But from what he's created. I mean, he created what we consider to be just this vast, infinite universe. He says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? So God still considers each and every person, right? And the son of man that thou visitest him. And I think that's also a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ as well, as God visits his people uh, by taking on flesh. But look what it says here in Hebrews 4 about the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a, high, have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So verse 15 is the one I want to point out to you guys this morning. It says, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. So we don't have a God, we don't have a savior that's in an ivory tower that doesn't understand how we feel, what we go through. I mean, we look in the garden of Gethsemane, we see that, you know, Christ, you know, was fearful of what was going to happen, right? He was concerned about what was going to happen to him. And also, um, you know, we saw that he wept, you know, we saw that he cried, we saw that he hungered, uh, we saw that he suffered in these ways. So uh, we see not only Christ's divinity in the sense that he knows everything that's going on, but we also see a side to him where we see his humanity, right? And we, and we, can, we can relate to him, but also he understands us, right? So we see, this is one thing that's important about the temptation of Christ, that we see that human side of him. Now, the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, uh, we can see that they are paralleled very closely with, <clears throat> they are paralleled very closely with the worldliness that we see in 1 John 2. So we'll go to 1 John 2 here. We see, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So what is worldliness? Sometimes people misunderstand what worldliness is. They think worldliness is just things that are in the world. And they'll say like, oh, Christians are against worldliness, but you know, we use computers and we use mobile phones and we use the internet. Um, you know, aren't these things that are in the world? So worldliness is not just modern conveniences, right? Worldliness is characterized, like the Bible says here in verse 17, the world passeth away and the lust thereof. So we get a definition here of what worldliness is. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. So the lust of the flesh is things that make you feel good, right? The lust of the eyes are things that are good to look at, right? Things that are nice to look at. And the pride of life, right? So this, this could be power, what people think of you and things like that. Your position in the world, lifting yourself up more than you ought. It's not of the Father, but is of the world. And as we look through the temptations of Christ, we'll see a similarity here with the, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This was the same temptations that Eve faced in the garden, right? When she was tempted by Satan. Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, you see there's that lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. You see, it looked nice. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. There's that pride of life, right? They wanted to be like God, to know good and evil. Um, that's like what Satan tempted them with. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Right? So Adam was not deceived. We learned about, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Eve was deceived. Adam knew full well. He was tempted with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and he did eat. So we see here in the temptation of Jesus Christ that Jesus, he succeeded at what Adam failed to do, right? He, he succeeded in resisting these sins and this lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So let's uh, look at them one by one. The first temptation in Luke 4, it says, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread, and Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, it's already hard enough to you know, resist the temptation for good food, and people often indulge in nice food. You know, when people travel, you know, that's usually what they do. You know, they travel, and they try foods here, and they try foods there. I mean, that's already a, a pleasure that people indulge in. But then imagine going 40 days and 40 nights without food, and then somebody comes to you and says, command that this stone be made bread. And you have the power to do it. You know, you can see that this temptation is quite strong. But we can see here that this first temptation, you see how it lines up with the lusts of the flesh, right? He's, he's fulfilling a pleasure of his body. Now we live, so we, we are trying, we, we're looking at these temptations because we want to relate to them, don't we? And see how they apply to us. And, you know, we live in a pleasure-rich society, don't we? And we live in a pleasure-centered society. You know, um, there, I don't know if you guys heard of the uh, book uh, by Aldous Huxley called A Brave New World. And um, there's two books that are quite famous about dystopian future, right? Like dystopian meaning the opposite of a utopia. Like a utopia is a perfect place. Dystopia is like when it's an absolutely terrible place, right? When they talk about dystopian future. Uh, the one that people talk about more often is 1984 by George Orwell. So when you hear people talking about an Orwellian future, this is a future where, you know, governments become authoritarian, right? And they're watching your every move. It's a surveillance state. It's a police state. They're telling you everything, uh, everything uh, that you can and can't do. But the other book that's very famous is called Brave New World. And Brave New World is the opposite, where it's, it's, author it's an authoritarian state, but instead of controlling via just surveillance and police state, it's controlling via pleasure, right? And it's like just constant entertainment, giving you drugs in order to make you feel good, having a society where it's just free sex and just people can do whatever they want. There's no laws regarding that. 
Um, so we see here in our society, we, we can take aspects and see aspects of George Orwell's 1984 in this authoritarian state, but we also see aspects of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, where you know the world, you know the world and the powers that be just feed you with constant entertainment and sports and movies and all that, and people, you know, they don't even care. Like we remember when lockdowns first started, and people didn't even mind. They're like, well, we just stay at home and we can just watch Netflix, you right? So I mean, back in the day when we didn't have Netflix, we didn't have these entertainments. I mean, you can't just lock people in their homes, right? Because they'd have nothing to do. Whereas now, in our brave new world, right, you can just be locked home and have all the access to everything at your home to the point where people don't even resist uh, these tyrannical orders, right? So we see that we live in this pleasure-centered world and, you know, we're so pain-averse as a society that we don't even let bad things happen to us when they're good for us. I mean, think about how we deal with infectious disease these days and back in the day you'd have like chicken pox parties and measles parties and that actually advertise it on the news and now it's just like one case of measles you have like no deaths at all and the country just freaks out why because they're so adverse to pain and so towards pleasure that they, they, don't, they don't even want to experience any discomfort right we can't we can't even let children lose anymore you know where everyone gets a medal you know there's like no winners and losers when uh, in school and they're worried about upsetting children and if they cry then that's a bad thing no we have to, to learn to, to deal with these things we can't just be a pleasure centered society I mean think about the way society deals with offense you know you can't be offended anymore and uh, for those of you who have worked in like corporate settings it's not just offense not offending people it's not even just about harassing people like, let's say you harass somebody and then you're bullying them and making fun of them and then, then you lodge a complaint that I'm offended by this. That's not, that's not even where the law goes. You'd think that that's offense. No, offense in the legal terms now is like anything that you expect somebody could take offense to, right? So this is why you have to be like so careful, you know, in corporate settings where they, you know, have HR departments and all that because even if you were just like saying a joke, to somebody else and not even harassing. If somebody else takes offense to that, it's like you should have known legally that somebody may have reason to get offended and not have said these things. So it's this kind of society that just goes away from just any sort of discomfort, dragging people up if they experience any sort of depression. It's a terrible um, way to deal with things. You know, people have to understand that, you know, things are not just about feeling good. And the same token, we should not be controlled by these pleasures. You know, addictions abound these days, you know, whether it's drugs or whether it's just pleasures. You know, people, they, they always need to be entertained, right? And, and it's in our society these days where we just have entertainment at our fingertips and, you know, people get addicted to their devices and they get addicted to social media. So it's not only that, it's not only food aspects, so maybe drugs, food, drinks, um, entertainment, and obviously also sexual gratification as well, right? And we see that in entertainment and all that too. So beware of these things. Now, not, not all these things are inherently bad in and of themselves, you know? So it's when they're done in excess or they're done not in the right place, right? But in excess, they are detrimental, right? 1 Peter 4, look what it says here, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, reveling. So you see how this is like excess things, like pleasure, not in and of itself. Like lasciviousness is talking about sexual pleasure, right? But that's not wrong in and of itself, right? It's in the confines of marriage. Lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. See, if you don't indulge in these things, if you're just a moderate Christian, some people think it's, it's odd of you, it's strange that you would live this way. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick 
and the dead. We see here also in the parable of the sower, just the two verses here in Mark 4, 18, 19, that the danger of these pleasures make us unfruitful for the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So we want to overcome these temptations because we don't want to be unfruitful for the Lord. And if we just live our life the way the world wants us to live our lives, just entertainment and feel like we just need to be entertained all the time, 24-7, everything needs to be fun, everything needs to feel good, we will go down this road. So what's the solution? 2 Corinthians 4. The solution is we need to look to the things of eternity. Right? So we get our perspective right, so we don't just live for the now. We don't just live for the pleasures of this life. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, if we compare what is to be gained by serving the Lord in eternity, right? what is to be gained by serving the Lord here, what we gain in eternity those pleasures of this life will diminish, right? You may not care that you get to experience everything here when you know anything you're going to experience in the world hereafter is going to be so much better than anything in this life. But we need to have this eternal perspective, right? We need to realize that the things of this life are temporary and we look to the things of eternity to understand that the things that we value here on this earth are not as valuable as we think while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal and you know it's a comforting thought as well that you know the things that happen in this life hey they're temporary but one day we will enter into eternity and we will be free from sin completely so that's the first temptation you can see that lines up command that these stones be made bread is alluding to the lusts of the flesh. So the second temptation you'll see will allude to the lusts of the eyes. Luke 4 says here, and the devil taking him up into a high mountain, look at this, showed him, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So obviously it alludes to somebody's lust for power as well. But we'll see in the last temptation that pride of life uh, and I'll, sh I'll show you how that sort of makes sense. But here, we see here him being shown all the kingdoms of the world. So this is a visual temptation, right? And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I, will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So it's not that he wants to be served. You know, through these riches, he needs to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to have that same attitude. Right? So this one is the lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So visuals are a very powerful thing, aren't they? Visuals. You know, you know, people say things like, you know, I'm really good with faces, but I don't remember names. You know? And how many people say that? Like so more people I'd say say that than say, you know what, I remember people's names, but I completely forget their faces. Right? Now they say that because visuals are such a powerful thing, you know, when we see things. You know, and that's why the Bible constantly tries to remind us that we walk by faith, not by sight. Because visuals are so powerful to the, us physically that we tend to believe the things we see. We react to the things we see rather than the things that we've heard from the Word of God and walking by faith in the Word of God. Um, I don't know if you ever see uh, you know, those videos where memory experts, they, they talk about you know, how to remember things. And how do they do it? You know, like they'll visualize things and then they'll kind of paint a picture of, you know, linking concepts together and they'll have to, what, visualize a room and they remember things not just by purely remembering the words, but they remember the story and the linking 
that they've linked things together. And I've heard one um, memory expert talk about like the way they remember like lots of stuff is they, they visualize like they walk into a room and then there's things on the wall and the way they link them all together. So my point here being like even people that remember a lot of things, it's ten it tends to be a visual exercise for them as well where they're trying to visualize these things. And um, I, I listened to this TED talk once that was really interesting where he asked people, you know, how, who struggles with memory and obviously a lot of people put their hand up and then he just put some random facts, you know, to, to find, try and get them to remember. But then as he does his talk, he says, you know, we'll link these concepts together and he starts telling a story with these concepts. And then he talks about memory and all that sort of stuff. And then at the end of the talk, he asks, well, do you remember, you know, what these pictures were? And because you remember that story that he told, you remember the sequence of the images. So I just thought that was uh, like a really interesting thing and just different techniques of how people remember things. Right. I mean, think about Apple. I mean, Apple as a company, all these companies that are so successful, what are they good at? They're good at marketing, right? And what is marketing? Marketing is appealing to your visuals. Like you see things and you know, either, either it's a product that looks really good and you say, oh, I want that. Or what do they do? They, they make you visualize a lifestyle and you say, oh, you know, and then it makes you want that. They, they, want, they need to show you that image. And Steve Jobs is famous for saying, you know, people don't know what they want until you show it to them, right? Because he understands that, you know, people are visual. They're drawn to these visual things. And, and being able to demonstrate something visually is a very powerful thing. So this is these lusts of the eyes. Let's go to Mark 8. Because if you notice in Luke 4, you see this phrase here in verse 8, get thee behind me, Satan. Right? And if you know your Bibles, you know where else Jesus said this. And I just wanted to show this link there between the lust of the eyes and desiring, you know, um, I guess the things, things, I guess, more than God. It's sort of related to how Jesus rebukes Peter here in Mark 8. He says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Just a, just a couple of things in this passage. So what's going on here is Jesus is saying that he's going to go and die for the sins of the people, right? And Peter basically tells him off and saying, this is not going to happen to you. And if you think about what, what Satan is also trying to do, Satan's also trying to prevent Jesus from going through with the will of God, right? So we see here that same spirit of Satan is sort of has infected Peter here, right? Where Peter's saying the same thing, trying to discourage Christ from going to the cross. And what's interesting here in verse 33, that before he rebukes Peter, he looks on his disciples. So he's not just responding directly to Peter. He realizes the influence of these words on the rest of the disciples. He looks about on them. So he's not only rebuking Peter for Peter's sake, but he's rebuking Peter for the sake of his disciples as well. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So you see how that spirit was putting the things of this world above the things of God. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save him. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Do you see how this is all tied into valuing the world above the will of God? So you see that temptation in the wilderness was, hey, here's all the kingdoms of the world. And here he is linking it up. Here, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And you know, sometimes we think about it this, this phrase here as, you know, what will I gain, right? Jesus is saying, if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul as in you. But I wonder when, when he thought this, you know, you wonder whether he's reflecting on this, you know, this temptation and that, that he, you know, could gain all these things. But 
it's not his own soul that he would lose, you know, but you know, if he didn't go to the cross, it's, we would lose it. Right? I just wonder whether there's that reflection in his mind as well in terms of he didn't want to profit and lose the souls of others. And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So how do we you know, overcome the temptation of the lust of the eyes and wanting to uh, gain these things? Well, I think what we should do is we should learn from other people's experience. Um, we have here Solomon talking in Ecclesiastes 5, and we know Solomon indulged in these things. We can learn from his experience. Verse 10 in Ecclesiastes 5, he says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? Right, so he's saying here, what we need to understand from God's word is that these things that we find so desirable, that we look at and we desire that thing or that lifestyle, will not satisfy you. Right? And he says here, if you love silver, you know, like wealth, you are not going to be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is vanity. What is he saying here in verse 11? He says, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. It's just that the more you have, the more people end up consuming them. And what good is there to the owners thereof? Saving the beholding of them with their eyes. He says, once you've earned all this stuff, you've got all these things, what good is it to you besides just looking at it? Right? That's what he's saying there. And you don't even have to learn this lesson from Solomon. You say like, yeah, well, Solomon's learning this lesson because, you know, Solomon's a Christian, Solomon's spiritual, and Solomon went through all these things. But it's not just Christians that come to this realization. I mean, how often do you hear about these super rich Hollywood stars or sports stars and they get to the end of it all and they just, they're depressed, they're taking drugs, you know, they're committing suicide, you know, they're realizing that all this stuff that, that, they, that they fought for and blood, sweat and tears went into, they realize, you know what, what was more valuable in my life was just my family, my children, just the things that are of value, the things that God expects us to value, you know, relationships, friendships, children, you know, and, and they may have given all that up in order, in the pursuit of, of those riches. So are we going to learn from the experience of others before you experience it yourself? I mean, are you going to chase the things that you desire and just come to the same realization? Or are you not going to waste your life, learn from people's experience, don't waste your time here on earth, and build up treasure in heaven rather than build up treasure on earth? First Timothy 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You see how there's that, there's that beautiful, I guess, irony there where you gain significantly by being content with the things that you have, right? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Uh, content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in perdition and, and destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. So it's the will to be rich, right? It's the love of money, right? It's not just money in and of itself. Making money can be a good thing and help a lot of people. I just saw a meme recently on my Facebook feed where, you know, there's this soccer star and he had like a cracked phone, right, with the cable going up to his headphones. So he doesn't even have like, you know, the, the I, uh, what do they call the um, iPod Air. What, what do they call those pro things? The cordless ones that everyone has now. Um, the screen on his phone was cracked and everyone's thinking like this, this, this soccer star that's earning millions of dollars, why doesn't he just buy a new phone? And he sort of replied to them saying, you know, it's like it works. So he doesn't have to indulge, he doesn't have all these fancy houses and fancy cars. 
and, and, and because he grew up on the streets, he wanted to give back. And a lot of his riches went back to like, you know, developing schools and, and all this charity work. And I just thought it was such a great thing that, you know, people that do find success in this life can do a lot of great things, right? So it's not, not a bad thing, but it's those that desire riches for the sake of riches. They're the ones that fall into this snare, right? And not for the purpose of serving God. So we should learn from other people's experiences, right? And trust that God's word is right. Trust and look to eternity to overcome that temptation, right? Of the lust of the eyes. Now let's go to the third temptation from Jesus Christ in Luke 4. He brought him, in, him, brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So what is, how is Satan tempting Jesus here? He basically takes him up to the top of the temple in Jerusalem, right? So Solomon's temple. Tells him to basically try and commit suicide. Jump off, cast yourself off. But he says, but don't, you don't have to worry about it because... The Bible says that the angels, you know, shall give their, give, shall, uh, what do you say? The, the angels shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands thou shalt bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. So he says, if you jump off, then if you're the Son of God, if you jump off, angels are going to come and save you, right? And people are going to know you're the Son of God, right? Because he's doing it off the pinnacle of the temple, right? There's obviously people at the temple. So the thing is, how is this the pride of life? Because I do think that these temptations right, line up with these lusts that we see here in 1 John 2. So we've seen the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, showing all the kingdoms of the world and that covetousness there. But it says, but the, and the pride of life. Now, pride is something that we know God hates. Proverbs 6, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Right, so these are seven things that God hates. The first one is a proud look. Now, how does this line up with pride? Well, do you know that the, 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 the verse that Satan is quoting comes from Psalm 91? Now let's read this. And now what you've what you got to realize is, you know, obviously Satan is quoting scripture, but he's, he's quoting scripture out of context, right? Like he's using it in a way that doesn't mean what it means. What is he saying it means to Jesus when he's tempting him? It means that, hey, if you prove you're the son of God, look at like you will be spared from suffering, right? Even if you try and kill yourself, the, he'll give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they'll lift thee up. You'll be spared from death. You'll be spared from suffering. And this is how people will know that you're the Son of God, right? If thou be the Son of God, cast yourself off, right? He's trying to get Jesus to prove that he's the Son of God. And if you remember, you know, the, the devils keep saying, you're the Son of God, thou the Son of God. And he said, quiet, right? Because what was going to declare that he was the son of God. Well, it was going to be the death, burial, and then the resurrection was going to declare that he was the son of God. So what is he being tempted to do here? He's being tempted to proclaim that he's the son of God in a way that has no suffering, right? And that's not the will of God. Psalm 91, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. So you can see how, like, hey, Satan. And this is like, this is what people do with Old Testament scriptures when it comes to work salvation. I mean, they, they misquote scripture, they use it out of context, right? Now let's keep reading. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shall trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. Look at this. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, watch this, and I will answer him. I will be with him 
in trouble. Right, so is, is this verse talking about never experiencing the suffering, never going through pain? No, it's going to, after he goes through the trouble with the Lord, that then he will, you know, things will, it's talking about his kingdom afterwards, right? That what happens afterwards? I will deliver him and honor him with, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Right, so you see there that how was this temptation about pride? Well, the pride was you declaring yourself to be the Son of God with what you want, right? Like your, it's like your will is to be spared from this punishment that you know you are going to go through. That's that's the temptation that's going on. But no, the the will of God and Jesus knows the will of God is that He's come to seek, you know, to die for the sins of the world, right? Through the death, burial, and resurrection. Matthew 26, if you remember in the garden, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Right? So you see there that that was the temptation. Why was it pride? Because it was putting the will, his own will above the will of God, right? His will as a human to be spared from this pain, but going through it anyway because it was the will of God. It showed that he put the will of God above himself because it was necessary for Jesus Christ to suffer before he was exalted rather than just being exalted without going through the pain and suffering, right? Philippians 2, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, see, because of these things, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see there, the glory was only meant to come once he had fulfilled the will of God, gone through the death and the suffering and the death of the cross to be exalted. But the pride there was to exalt himself without having to go through that. And I often wonder, you know, like when we read sort of the rest of Luke 4, that, you know, what was... You know, you know how the devils said they know who Jesus is. And, um, you know, sometimes we think, is, is, it just the, is it just the devils, like, acknowledging because they knew who Jesus was? Sometimes we think that. Or is it that, you know, Christ, ha you know, like, people tend to, um, you know, say, you know, Jesus kind of played it wisely, how... You know, it was a bit of a marketing ploy, right? Like where, you know, build up suspense and not tell everyone he's the son of God and then that makes people talk about it. But maybe there's a deeper truth to it in that the sense that he had to go through the suffering. There was a plan to go through. And the resurrection is what declared like the centurion, you know, the death and resurrection, truly this man is the son of God, right? That's what kind of declared it to the world. And I wonder whether... Maybe the, the, the ploy of the devils was to declare him the son of God so that he wouldn't have to go, so he wouldn't be crucified, right? He wouldn't have to go, wouldn't go through all those things. I just wonder whether there was a more nefarious plan than just, you know, them being scared of him and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and recognizing him for who he is. You know, he, they were trying to openly declare, this is the son of God so that he wouldn't go through what they knew he had to go through which was um, dying on the cross. I wonder. Hebrews 2, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Right? So this is how he was going to be exalted. So what's, how do we overcome this temptation to lift ourselves up? Well, we need to submit ourselves to the will of God. We need to submit ourselves to the word of God. James 4, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. 
Right? So how do you submit yourself to God? Well, this is when you obey the word, right? The submission is not just a passiveness. It's, it's when you hear something in the word, you hear the word of God preached, and you say, you know what, I'm going to do that instead of doing what I want to do. Like Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. That you put the will of God over your own will. That is submission, right? Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hand, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Look at this in verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Look at this. And he shall lift you up. So you see how we don't lift ourselves up? We humble ourselves, and then God lifts us up. You know, I've heard a great saying, saying, you know, your job is to humble yourself. God's job is to lift you up. And, and people will say, if you start doing God's job, right, he'll start doing yours. <laughs> so I always thought that was a great, great uh, thought there. You know, make sure you're doing your job because if you do God's job, God will make sure he does yours to humble you because that's your job. So some practical applications just at the end here. In terms of how Jesus... Otherwise, like things that we see in the passage where Jesus dealt with these temptations. Right? So we know there's the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We see, we talked about just ways we can overcome them, but here's particularly how Jesus dealt with them in these temptations, right? Luke 4, one thing I wanted to point out in the passage in verse 13. It says, And that when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed. From him for a season. He departed from him for a season. Right? Now, what can we learn here? That Jesus knew that this was not the end. And this is important for us when we try and battle in temptation. Sometimes you win, but you've got to realize that that's not the end. That temptation will come creeping, it's rearing its head again. You know, it's not like you just overcome a temptation once and you're just never tempted by it again. It's like here, Satan left Jesus, but he departed from him for a season, right? So there's that expectation. We have to have that expectation that temptations that we have struggled with and may have overcome for a season will come again. So we have to take heed to ourselves lest we fall again. All right, 1 Corinthians 10. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. That's a Interesting verse to keep note of that. Verse 10, they tempted the Lord Jesus Christ, but weren't they tempting the Lord Jehovah back then in the wilderness and were destroyed of serpents? Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So we're being warned here not to you know, go down the temptations and yield to the temptations that they yielded to in the Old Testament. Verse 12. Wherefore, because it said wherefore, you got to, you know, when they say wherefore or therefore, we got to think about where it's, why it's therefore. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So not only is it don't think you're above these temptations, right? These things are there for our admonition because they fell. Don't let them get you. But at the same time, take heed lest ye fall that even temptations that you may have struggled with in the, in the past and, and think you have overcome them, know that they will come again, right? That's why you have to take heed. You have to be diligent of temptations and put things in place so that when they come again, you can overcome them once more. There had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee 
from idolatry. So verse 13 is a very encouraging verse for us to know. Hey, there's no temptation taking you, but such that is common to man. So anything that you're struggling with, every man, woman, child suffers the same temptations. Now, they may not be the same specific temptations, but remember, they're the same categories of temptations. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And not only every man, like Jesus also, we remember. He was not uh, also touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus understands as well. And this is encouraging thought because you know that the things you're going to through, you're not the only one that goes through them, right? They are common to man. But what does it say here? God will provide a way to escape. So either you are able to bear it or he will provide you a way out, a, a way to bear it, right? A way to escape that you, you, may, you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. So we need to expect that temptations will come back, take heed to them, take steps to avoid them so when they come back, we don't fall to them again. Um, you know, we realize that temptation is common to man, but God will provide a way to escape. So how did Jesus respond in each time he was tempted in Luke 4. Well, he responded with the word of God, didn't he? So, so the solution is to have faith, number one, Romans 10. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we see there in Luke 4, each time Jesus responded with the word of God. So we need to have faith in the word of God. Now to have faith in the word of God, you need to know the word of God, right? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So faith is not just this nebulous feeling where people just go, yes, believe, believe, I believe, you know, believe in myself, you know, people say, like, I believe in myself to do these things. No. Faith is faith in God's Word. But you know what? If you don't know God's Word, how can you have faith in God's Word, right? You need to know what God's Word says to believe what God's Word says, right? So these two things are interlinked. Your amount of faith is going to increase based on the amount of knowledge you have of God's Word. right? So it's increasing your faith by believing God's Word and believing what of God's Word too. Now faith, you don't want a dead faith, right? So it's not just about having faith, but you want to add works to your faith. And we see that in Jesus' temptation too. Remember when he began... He was baptized, he went into the wilderness, then he was tempted of the devil, he overcame that temptation. So it showed that he had faith, right? And then what happens immediately after that temptation? He gets to work. He's healing people in the temple, he's preaching, and he says to the end of Luke 4, hey, there's other cities I've got to preach the gospel also, right? So we need to add faith to our works so that we don't have a dead faith, right? That doesn't mean we're not saved, where you can be saved and have a dead faith, but you don't want to have a dead faith in the sense that you have a faith that's not profitable to anyone. Right? That's a famous saying in James 2, probably for the wrong reasons, but the right reasons is to encourage people to do works so that their faith is not dead in the sense that they are useless to the kingdom of God and useless to themselves. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Alright, so we see the temptation of Jesus Christ, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, lust of the flesh, we can overcome them by you know looking to eternity right the lust of the eyes we can help overcome by learning from other people's experience and then the, the pride of life you know we want to submit to the will of god rather than submitting to our own will how do we do that we have faith in god's word you know we understand that temptations come but we want to submit to god's will and right? we do that by 
obeying God's word over our own desires. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, we pray and ask you to help us, Lord, to not yield to temptation and uh, help us as Christ did to overcome, to have faith in your word and to submit to your word and your will, not our will. So thank you, Lord, for the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he overcame sin and was our perfect saviour. We pray and ask these things in his name. Amen.